Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Professor Watts. Watts. Um, and I just I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with everyone today. Again, coming after General Murray's remarks, coming after Professor Watts is such a, a wonderful but really insightful outlining of where we are in the process, where we are uh, moving forward. Um, and I just I really want to, to thank you um, and hopefully you understand coming from from the short half day of discussion how important this partnership is between Lieber Institute, Army Futures Command and specifically my part of Army Futures Command, the Directorate of Concepts. Um, just very quickly, Colonel Cora had approached me last fall asking if we would be interested in this and it was about the same time that General Murray had asked us to be looking at the, the future concept and it seemed like an opportunity that was too good to be true, um, but I, I would say that we are benefiting every single day from these insights, uh, which we absolutely want and need. So my remarks are going to be fairly short uh, because I want to set the, the groundwork for two of my teammates who are going to be coming up that would be talking in a little bit more detail about the lessons that we've been learning so far on the, the future of land warfare. So Lieutenant Colonel Keith Donnell and Adam Talaferro, um, they're going to be talking to you. Uh, our the director of concepts were actually split between uh, Fort Eustis, which is in Southern Virginia and here in Austin. Um, and so we're kind of doing the, the split screen right now. Um, but I'm confident that what you're going to see is, is that this partnership is real, uh, but there's also a lot more work to come, which is why we're really excited to talk to you. So I have four slides today that I'm going to be talking through. Um, first is just to describe very quickly what Army Futures Command does, what its main roles are and how we from the concepts community fit in it. Um, the second is to talk just very briefly on what are multi-domain operations so that you understand what's, what is the operational approach from which we're shifting from. Um, the third is to outline the task that General Murray has given us, um, and that's really us within the Army Futures Command on behalf of the Army. And then the fourth, what's that methodology by which that we are learning some of these insights, the future study program that Professor Watts just talked about. Um, but before I jump into this, what I'd like to say, and this is really building off of what Professor Watts just mentioned about how seriously that we in uniform uh, and then across the army, whether it's the civilians or the military or those that are working with us, take seriously. Um, so three points quickly. So one um, is that the, the ethical principles that are outlined in the Department of Defense's AI approach, the AI strategy, those are consistent between now and in the future. Um, as far as those, those principles that are outlined in the Geneva Convention that every single one of us on our identification card says specifically, but they're also part of the American founding principles. And that's a core of who we are and a core of where we're moving forward. The second thing though, and this is really building off of, of the discussion that General Murray had, but also some of the, the things Professor Watts brought up, is that when we look into the future and if we are fighting a peer adversary, that warfare will not look like the past 20 years in counterinsurgency. And that has real implications, both from an operational perspective, but also directly from the, the legal and the law of armed conflict, the implications. And then the third, and this very clearly pulls on what Professor Watts just mentioned, um, which we on the concept side feel extremely strongly as well, is that our adversaries are not likely going to be bound by the same ethical standards that we have. Um, however, if we can understand how we think they're going to be using these tools, it can help us better respond while still remaining the Americans that, that we are and that we're going to be holding ourselves accountable for. Um, so someone that is not from the legal community but has a deep respect for the community um, that we're working with, we're really eager to work together on these collective challenges. So just very quickly, the, the slide that you see in front of you, um, Army Futures Command, uh, stood up about three years ago. The, this is the first four-star command that the Army has stood up since 1973. So it is a major investment from the Army's perspective in the people and in the focus to be better prepared for those land conflicts, uh, those land competitions that we have to be doing whatever the country asks us. Um, and so what you see on here are the, the slides, this is actually our Army Futures Command slide, um, with the first role being that describing that future operational environment. So this is led by the Army Futures Command Directorate of Intelligence and Security. Those of you that are familiar with military organizations, that is effectively our G2. They're the ones that look to the future as far as what are the threats, what are the opportunities, um, and what are those challenges in the, in, in the environment, but also in those that are wishing to do us harm that we have to be prepared for. 
they are our link to the intelligence community and also making sure that everything that we do has that threat uh, information from the background. The second is, is what we do uh, specifically. The Army Futures Command is the Army's lead for concepts, for the future concepts, which includes my directorates, which we are directly a part of the Futures and Concepts Center led by my boss, who's Lieutenant General Scott McKean. And so a concept, how we describe it, or an aspirational idea. And it's aspirational either because the technology isn't yet mature enough, it's because we haven't figured out or created enough a way to be able to employ that technology or both. And so as you see on the, the slide, not only does it have the light bulb, but it also has the beaker. And part of that reason is, is that within the Army Futures Command, as we're developing these concepts, we are working very closely, not only with the threat community, which is on the left-hand side, but also the tremendous science and technology experts that exist. So whether it's through the centers or the Army Research Labs that are a part of the Combat Capabilities Development Command, or DEVCOM, our medically focused science and technology experts that are part of the Medical Research and Development Command, or MRDC, the Army Artificial Intelligence Center, AI2C, and others. And then the third block, which is also within the Futures and Concepts Center, the Army uses the concepts that we develop to then experiment with, because you don't want to come up with a good idea, but not actually know whether it works better. And so whether it's through the Joint Modernization Command, whether it's through some of our the, the uh, CDIDs that exist across the, the FCC, what we do then is we experiment to then develop and deliver requirements for the future force, the future force designs. And that's led including by the Futures Integration Directorate, which is part of FCC, in close cooperation with many of our science and technology partners, the Research and Analysis Center, or TRAC, which is a part of AFC, and then the AFC headquarters itself. And then finally, the last block, the, the Army Futures Command headquarters, along with the cross-functional teams, MRDC, TRAC, and others, an all in close coordination with the acquisition community that's led by the Office of the Assistant Secretary, of acquisition, logistics, and technology, um, focused on supporting the delivery of modernization solutions to the warfighter, so that when someone has a good idea, we're able to move that idea much faster and with the needed speed, range, lethality, and precision to make sure that our soldiers never fight a fair fight. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so just very briefly on where the Army is today on concepts um, before sharing where we're going. So in January of 2018, the National Defense Strategy came out and said we needed to focus on great power competition. And so building on focused experimentation that the Army had done since 2014, the Army published its current operational approach, which we call Multi-Domain Operations, or MDO, and that we published in December of 2018 to focus on new operational challenges that we faced at the time. Those challenges included the multiple layers of standoff, of which we call the Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD, which make us much harder for the joint force to get to where we need to go. And we're going to be challenged in all domains. So that's the land, the sea, the air, but also space and cyberspace, electromagnetic spectrum, and the information dimension. All of those domains we expect to be contested, and we're going to have to fight for windows of opportunity. We know that there are multiple great power competitors. This isn't back during the Cold War where we knew things were pointed in one direction. However, we are interconnected economically along with our allies and partners with these competitors. Um, and in addition, we also have regional and transnational threats that we have to be prepared for in addition to the large scale peer conflict. And then finally, in addition to the conflict and what General Murray talked about specifically, is that ongoing daily fierce, intense competition for power and influence. We have great power competitors that want to win without fighting. And we want to also make sure from a deterrence perspective that we're not losing without fighting. Um, and that's why the work to have the strong allies and partners together and how we go about competing, how we go about conflict really matters. And so to counter these challenges alongside our joint partners, the Army identified the three tenants or foundations that you see on the slide. We need to develop these ahead of time so that we're able to prosecute warfare. Um, these also help us in competition to be better positioned to provide that deterrence, but to also to be able to assure and work with our allies and partners. Um, and the three tenants that you see, the calibrated force posture, what that is effectively is we need units and capabilities 
to be able to be in key locations around the world, whether that's permanently or being able to move in and out um, so that they can work with our allies and partners. The second one, we need the units and leaders to be able to work across the domains. So the multi-domain task force, which you, you may have heard of, but we need these units, we need leaders to be able to, to leverage capabilities in space, to leverage capabilities in cyber, to be able to work with our, our joint partners in a way where it's, it's much more than just the land fighting on and from that we've done um, up to this date. And then last, this is one of the topics that General Murray brought up as well as convergence. So we need to be able to link all sensors, the best shooter, the right command and control node in near real time. And this allows to speed up the decision cycle, the sense, understand, decide, act, and assess to more rapidly and effectively than our adversary. Um, and what Chris Bros and others have called kill chains or kill webs. And our convergence also, we can't just talk to the Army, and we have to be able to work with our joint partners, so the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, as well as our multinational partners. And so significant work is going on to implement, or what we in the Army often call operationalize, these multi-domain operations into practice. So in addition to the Army's six modernization priorities and tremendous effort of our eight cross-functional teams, much of this work is being led by the U.S. Army's TRADOC Training and Doctrine Command, excuse me, at the Combined Arms Center, um, including to update our doctrine of how the Army will be fighting um, the Field Manual 3.0 that next summer will be multi-domain operations. We're updating our curriculums at schools, so not only at schools like West Point, but those for our captains and our majors and our colonels and our generals, our sergeants and our enlisted, our, uh, our sergeant majors. Um, we're developing uh, synthetic training uh, in addition to updating our training that are our combat training centers. We want to make sure that our soldiers have more and more realistic repet repetitions to help build some of that trust that General Murray was talking about is absolutely essential for us being able to use these new tools. And then finally, the systems that we have are developing greater speed range and convergence. So we need to have those new facilities so that we can actually train and prepare on them. However, as challenging as this future is, one of the highlights that the Directorate of Intelligence and Security, so in the last slide, the, the, the left-hand side box, the future operational environment 2035 to 2050 that it outlined is that the potential for intensifying military threats and rapidly changing technology make it probable that by 2035 and beyond, future warfare is going to be different. And so just a couple of things that we're seeing. So the maturing disruptive technologies, General Murray talked about the AI, autonomy, robotics, all underpinned by data in the network. Um, absolutely could impact how we could fight, how we must be equipped, and how we must be organized in formations, and really forcing us to look at what must humans do in warfare. We are looking at how can forces hide, mask, uh, achieve surprise when we have near ubiquitous sensors, um, information activities, so it's the movement of data and it's the movement of ideas moving at machine speed that's going to impact our tempo, whether it's in the, the character of the competition, crisis, and conflict. And then also from a Tesla example, the maturing sustainment methods. So whether the, the different alternative fuels that we have, semi-autonomous and autonomous delivery, advanced manufacturing, synthetic biology will absolutely impact, uh, especially if we're able to leverage some of these together. And all of these challenges I mentioned are still building off of the challenges that we identified in multi-domain operations. Um, so things are just becoming more, com more complex. So next slide. So as we operationalize multi-domain operations, we're also developing and then we'll experiment with a new operational level of concept for warfare for 2035 and beyond. And what we've listed here is a task that General Murray gave my team uh, when I arrived here late last summer, looking at how Army forces could employ decisive land power in 2035 as part of a joint force and a part of the combined forces, so working with our multinational partners, um, against a peer adversary, which will likely have a similar level of technology, intelligence, and will to win. Um, and so our task in about five pages which I must say, depending on your background, is whether that's a really long paper or a really short paper, is to provide the framework and a narrative or a story fashion that helps describe how the Army, working alongside our partners, could operate, could be equipped, and could be organized. Um, all right, and so the next slide. 
And so this is my final slide. And what this depicts is a key process by which we're developing this 2035 and beyond framework narrative, including with which the Lieber Institute experts are participating and have been a core effort, core teammates within this. Um, and this is what we'll be using to share some of the insights for the rest of the discussion this morning. And so we call this the Future Study Program or Unified Quest. It's the Army's formal, it's our Title X war game, um, providing Army senior leaders a versatile tool to be able to study whatever the most pressing operational leadership uh, um, doctrinal challenge that we have at the time. And so we do seminars, tabletop exercises, and war games to help commanders think through what are these challenges, um, to help staffs and leaders to be able to stand what are the ways that we could do things better. Um, and this year, we're focused on the 2035 and beyond challenge. And so, so again, the what you see in the slide are the four events that we're having this year to develop this framework of the new operational concept. And so our first week long event was in November and we looked at the character of warfare. So building from the threat assessments, the operational assessment in the future operational environment, 2035 to 50, we had about 70 panelists from across the US Army and Department of Defense, academia, think tanks, our international partners, and our goal was to build consensus on what future warfare could look like. Again, realizing that we're going to be wrong. We just don't want to be too wrong. And what are some of those unique challenges that will likely surface that we would need to be able to address? We had about 400 participants that participated virtually. And then in February, we held an event primarily for Army audiences. Uh, again, this is where Libra was again a part of it, narrowing down those future warfare insights for what would that then mean for the Army and for future land warfare against a peer threat. And so Colonel Donnell and Major Talaferro will be talking to you much more about what we learned. But I also want to say it also raised a lot more questions than for which we were able to get answers. And so third, in about two weeks, we'll have the third session of our future study program. And when many Army and Department of Defense science and technology experts who've also been deeply involved with the first two events will now help lead our thinking on how emerging technology solutions could help us overcome operational challenges. And so this approach that we call Team Ignite, which you see at the bottom banner, um, is, is designed to bring these experts together into the process from the beginning. And as General Murray told me in my in brief when I came, it's like the s and community needs to help ensure that we concept writers aren't writing science fiction or fantasy. But on the flip side, we in the concepts community must help inform them so that they understand what are some of those priority solutions that could make a significant difference in how the Army is able to operate in the future. And as depicted on the slides bottom, they also, in addition to the s and experts, we have our threat experts, um, as well as experts coming from across the operational community. And this is precisely where the legal experts and where Lieber Institute and where we are hoping many of you are able to help reside as well. And so by having your expertise brought in in the beginning, not only can you help us with questions that we know we have, but you're able to help proactively think about things that we haven't even thought yet to ask and to help integrate some of those solutions uh, much earlier in the process. And then finally on the right hand side, our fourth future study program event this year will be at the end of August. And that will be the first deliberate effort to experiment with what could be in our future operational approach. We'll be leveraging opportunities that maturing science and technology can enable, but also ones that we think that our potential threats could demand. And so in closing, we want and we need this partnership with you all to think deliberately, thoughtfully, and responsibly through the legal implications of the new warfare challenges that are most likely coming, um, but also ones we haven't seen in generations. And the work we're doing right now is of real need but it also presents real opportunities for all of us. And so technology that we're using every day is making our lives easier, but it's also creating security and privacy challenges. The information and the different applications are allowing us to stay connected with loved ones during this pandemic. And frankly, many of you probably would not have been able to attend this session had we not done it virtually. Um, however, it's also creating opportunities for things like deep fakes and to add doubt into data which can mean really big challenges when you're on the battlefield. Um, but as our last SecDef said, when the Department of Defense adopted the ethical principles for AI, AI technology will change much about the battlefield of the future, but nothing will change America's steadfast commitment 
to responsible and lawful behavior. And so we take to heart this guidance um, as we develop the Army's next operational concept alongside you all. And frankly, our kids and grandkids would expect no less. And so I look forward to answering questions um, after Keith and, and Adam talk. And just again, thank you, uh, John, um, Colonel Cora, for allowing us to be a part of today's discussion.